Hi, greetings everyone. Um, here you can see our new offices. They're almost finished here in St. Pete. Uh, we're really excited uh, to be moving into these new offices. It's been kind of crammed, so um, uh, welcome. Uh, so uh, this, this month's uh, video is called Defanged. And I, I think what is happening here is uh, many investors, both growth and value, are beginning to understand uh, the world of disruption out there. Uh, even the fangs are being disrupted. Many, many growth managers think they have the right kind of exposure to innovation uh, in, in the form of the fangs, or they did at the beginning of the, this year. And uh, much of that kind of thinking has disappeared here. Uh, and so what, what I will do later in this call is talk a little bit about what this means uh, and how it is distinguished from the kinds of strategies we're involved in. Um, the, the FANGs became the biggest parts of the benchmarks uh, like the S&P and uh, the NASDAQ, especially the NASDAQ 100. And uh, again, that was very backwards looking. Those stocks rose to the top uh, because of past success. And then TikTok came along and talk about disruption. And then a recession comes along uh, as exemplified by the advertising um, crash that is taking place and hurting many of these companies. Uh, and we're seeing layoffs and freezes, uh, something we've never seen from these companies. Uh, but that's, that's distinguished uh, from the kind of innovation in our strategies. Um, we are very early stage. And while our stocks may have suffered as uh, much as, as the fangs have, certain of the fangs have, um, that what we're seeing right now is very early stage growth. Uh, so we can talk about that in a little while. I just wanted to set that up. It has been one heck of a, a rough time for innovation of all kinds uh, in the last 18 months. Uh, but if we are right, if we are right, and of course we could be wrong, but if we're right, um, truly disruptive innovation is, is, is going to move into a growth trajectory that um, we believe will make what has happened recently to their stocks look like a blip in hindsight, given the great strides ahead. Uh, so that's distinct from the kind of disruption that's taking place and causing some trouble for tried and true, uh, the stocks that have become big parts of benchmarks. So that's just a prelude to um, set up for this call. Um, now I will go through in the, the typical order, fiscal policy, monetary uh, policy, economic indicators, and market indicators with a few last words about innovation at the end. So on fiscal policy, uh, well, the midterms uh, are upon us uh, next week. And um, if, if the polls are correct, it does look like there will be um, a shift back to conservatives in, in certainly the House, but uh, perhaps even the Senate. And um, we think that, uh, that the, the, the stance of many conservatives is, is to push back on excessive regulation. Regulation can be an innovation killer. Uh, so that will be, that will be good news. Um, and uh, we think there will be other innovation-friendly moves in terms of incentives and so forth. Um, what's interesting about uh, this election and this period in time is historically, and, and this is just history, this is, believe me, not at all partisan, it's just uh, observing. Historically, uh, the market has done better under democratic uh, administrations. And the conservatives would tell you, well, that's because we would have to come in and, and clean up all of the excesses, uh, the excess spending, the excess monetary um, stimulus. And, uh, and that would mean a crackdown on, on certain businesses 
which would be bad for the market and bad for psychology. Seems like it's the opposite here. I have never seen uh, fiscal outlays, federal outlays down at a double digit rate in the uh, in a, a midterm election year or a, a, a national election year. And yet here we are down, down year over year. And I have never seen monetary restraint, uh, the, the likes of which we're seeing now um, in a midterm election year. In fact, historically, during election years, midterm or the national uh, elections, we saw Federal Reserves basically saying to themselves, perhaps, but it, it seemed like uh, we observed the, their actions uh, to be, okay, get all of uh, what we need to do out uh, in the, early in the year so that we're not accused of being political. And uh, that has not happened this time. In fact, at the time in past uh, Fed uh, uh, regimes, um, that they would be uh, basically going neutral, just status quo, uh, that probably would have been around February, March of this year. And yet that is when the Fed really started uh, to, to crank up interest rates uh, at a rate we have never seen historically, never. We have never seen this. Many people equate uh, what uh, uh, what happened during Volcker's years as similar. Volcker was really trying to throttle uh, inflation and raised interest rates from uh, roughly 10% to roughly 20%. Uh, that's a twofold increase. Uh, with this week's action from the Fed, another 75 basis points, um, the, the Fed has taken interest rates up 16-fold in less than a year. Never been done before. And I think we're going to see the fallout during the next year. Uh, and, and when I say that, uh, I mean it will be a, a cyclical fallout. And I think it will benefit those companies that can grow through this period. Um, and as we said all during COVID, innovation solves problems. We have so many more problems now. Uh, supply chains loosening up, but still we have the war in Ukraine. Uh, and now we have uh, fiscal and monetary policy um, really tightening in a way that businesses are going to have to change the way they do things, increase productivity, cut costs, and so forth, uh, in order to navigate through this very difficult environment. Uh, we think that will accrue ultimately to those companies who uh, facilitate those kinds of productivity moves, cost controls, and so forth. Now, in terms of monetary policy itself, um, this, this last month, I did write an open letter to the Fed um, just for one reason. It, it was to say, wait a minute, uh, there are 12 members voting here and, uh, and you've been unanimous over the last few Fed decision points. Uh, unanimous, 12 of you. This, how can this be? There's so much conflicting evidence out there. Uh, and. Uh, and I put into the letter some of the conflicting evidence, uh, primarily uh, the uh, early stage of the pipeline uh, from an innovation point of view, commodities uh, falling uh, dramatically, and we'll get, to, we'll get to that in a moment. And, uh, and the fact that inventories are overwhelming the system. And I think we'll see that in terms of huge discounts uh, at Christmas. Even the Fed's own, um, that there are regional uh, territories uh, where the Fed engages with business leaders. There are 12 of them. Uh, even these, these, I know they're not called uh, territories, I think they're called banks, uh, are, are showing in their uh, monthly indicators. So the Empire Fed puts one out, the Philly Fed, Richmond, Kansas City, Dallas, uh, and these, these are uh, quantitative indicators. They may be subjective surveys, but um, they are subjective all, all the way along. 
and they are hitting the skids one by one, negative territory, negative, negative. I looked through the last month's worth and all of the, all of the banks that I just mentioned um, were showing increasingly negative sentiment uh, about economic activity in their regions. Um, so, and, and prices, prices actually falling. And we, we did see that in the purchasing managers index, prices paid uh, index, um, showed uh, negative prices. And I, again, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so money now, money, M2 growth peaked at 27% in uh, mid-2020. Um, mid and as of September, it was down to 2.6%. It looks like October could be below 2%, maybe 1.5%. And effectively, money is falling. Money, if you look sequentially, is falling. Now, the only time we've had a sustained decline in money on a year-over-year -year basis, again, we're not negative year-over-year -year yet, but that's where we're heading, was during the Great Depression. And uh, hold that thought because uh, I'm going to describe uh, why we're not in the environment that the Fed thinks we are, which is the 70s. Um, and the reason is, I think I set this up in the, in, in the last YouTube video. In the 70s, when, when Volcker inherited a very bad def, uh, inflationary situation, so inflation was moving into the high single digits, low double digits, mid double digits is where it peaked. Um, so he inherited that. But, but it had taken 15 years for that inflation to uh, move to those levels. Now, uh, the, it started in April and May of 1964, Vietnam War, great society programs, the Johnson administration, um, putting into place many, many, many social programs at once. And it was a period called guns and butter. So spend on everything, which they did. Uh, so we had fiscal uh, policy moving really out of control and monetary policy accommodating it. Uh, and also, uh, as we went off the gold exchange standard in 1971, we closed the gold window. That was the last semblance of discipline in our monetary policy. That was 1971, as I said. You know, all hell broke loose. We had uh, OPEC quadrupling oil prices. We had uh, the Fed accommodating those oil prices, which eventually got into uh, all kinds of indicators, in, including wages. And you'll often hear the expression cost push inflation. It comes from the 70s. Uh, the cost push was wages pushing through. Uh, and uh, I think this time is, is very different. Um, then you had Volcker, as I mentioned, going from 10 to 20 percent, uh, so twofold interest rates, and that did the job. That did the job. Um, this period is not 15 years. Uh, by the time the Fed started addressing it, it was 15 months. Uh, so we didn't have a lot of time uh, for inflation to get out of control. And the inflation that we were talking about this time is not the monetary driven inflation. It was a supply shock to the system. So the supply chain imbalances, which I never thought would last for two years, still puzzling over that one, um, uh, that that was a real problem, a supply shock, a shock to the system. So uh, if the supply's not there, but the demand is because of all of the stimulus, then what happens? Uh, demand up relative to supply means prices go up. Uh, they go up until the supply meets the demand. Now we're moving into that part of the story. And I think we'll see it um, in action, in, in dramatic action uh, this holiday season as retailers who are just brimming with inventories, trying to figure out what to do, are, are forced to slash prices. And we're already seeing 20, 30, 50 percent uh, discounts if you go to Walmart, and I'm surprised to see it at Walmart. I thought that was everyday low prices, Target, uh, and other places. The other thing that's very different about this period relative to the 70s is the dollar has been moving up. 
uh, in the 70s, the dollar was moving down. In fact, we ended up in a, a dollar crisis in 1978. And I believe that's one of the reasons uh, that President Carter um, basically got rid of Miller, that Fed chairman, and, uh, and brought in um, Chairman Volcker. Uh, and that, that, that was a terrific, uh, terrific move. Now, the dollar in the early 80s uh, started moving up dramatically and it, and it almost went parabolic and became a real problem for the world. Uh, does that sound familiar? Here we are again. Um, the dollar going up is a massive deflationary force and uh, it's deflationary because commodities are priced in dollars, the reserve currency. It's deflationary because emerging markets have a lot of dollar-denominated debt. Their, their currencies are falling apart, but they have to service their debt in dollars. Uh, so it's a real killer. And, um, and so that is happening now. And you'll notice that uh, a lot of banks around the world are starting to... Um, move against the Fed. They had been aligned with the Fed, but the BOE, Bank of England, because of the liability-driven investment debacle, uh, which brought down uh, trusts, um, the, the BOE had to step back and say, no, we're here to support. This is a, a near Lehman moment. We must support our banks uh, because if, if these pension funds cannot meet margin calls, then the banks, uh, which were the other side of the swap trade, uh, would be left uh, holding the bag. And so the BOA has, BOE has pulled back, maybe not verbally, but in action. You've got the BOJ, so Japan, PBOC, both supporting their currencies, um, which means what are they doing? They're selling dollars and buying their currencies. That's adding dollar liquidity to the system. Uh, and we saw Australia uh, this past week uh, increasing its interest rate only 25 basis points. Uh, and so you've got uh, the central banks basically saying, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Australia would be very sensitive to commodity prices. And uh, in a moment, I'll give you a sense of the drama that's going on in terms of commodity price inflation or deflation, which of course is the early stage of the pipeline for uh, inflation in final demand indicators. Okay, so let's go to two other periods in history. So we don't think this is the 70s. What could this be? All right, looking back in history, there are two periods uh, that, that remind us of what we're going through right now. One is really 1918 through 21. And uh, so that was a period of war, World War I, uh, coming to an end. And um, so World War I and uh, the flu, the Spanish flu, which was much more... Um, which was much more vicious than COVID-19, killed as a percentage of the population, a much greater percentage of the global population. So war and flu, again, sounds familiar. And uh, we were in the middle of one of the greatest innovation booms in history, telephone, electricity, automobile, transformational, truly disruptive. Sort of sounds like today, right? Okay, so from... Uh, when when uh, we were experiencing the supply shocks associated with both the war, which which was a very long, well, we, we haven't been through nearly as long uh, a war as they uh, went through then, um, and then the Spanish flu, uh, the Dow Jones, Dow Jones Industrial Average from November of 19 to August of 21 went down 46%. Inflation associated with these problems, again, mostly supply chain, uh, uh, I would submit, um, inflation hit 15 to 25%. It was in that range for, for uh, a while. Again, that war was longer, the, the flu was longer. Um, it certainly took a much longer time to, uh, uh, to unwind than ours has. 
Um, so, so that was a very bad period. But that inflation within a year, again, it was a couple of years, the inflation, that inflation turned down and um, moved into deflation. Uh, I think the deflation was something like 15%. Yes, it was 15%. Um, so so uh, that was June of 21. So it went from 24% of June of 20 uh, to 16, minus 16% of June 21. Now, I've been saying for quite some time that I think the bigger risk here is deflation. Now, it's a, a risk and an opportunity in a sense. The risk is on the cyclical side. Uh, it's uh, the supply chains have having um, been so out of balance that inventories were overwhelming. I believe that's what happened back then. And uh, prices just fell very dramatically within a year. That would be cyclical, but it would also be uh, secular because telephone electricity and automobile were n innovations following learning curves and the costs associated with them were falling fairly dramatically. That's, that's what we've uh, been describing here. And, wh and what happened then? So starting in, um, in I think it was mid-21, uh, we moved into the roaring 20s. Um, so here we are again in the 20s. And we think they could be roaring 20s now um, from... Uh, Mid-21 through September of 29, uh, the Dow Jones compounded at an annual rate of 25% per year. Um, so that would, be, that would be the good news scenario. Now, there is a possibility that there's a bad news uh, outcome here. If you look at 1929 to 30, there are also some similarities to where we are today. Uh, Monetary policy was tightening aggressively. Now, inflation was not a problem then. Uh, in fact, it was quite low. But the Fed was railing against financial speculation associated with the Roaring Twenties. Um, and, uh, and, and it made a mistake because inflation, again, one of the main reasons the Fed is around uh, and really had just been created, uh, was to solve for price stability keep prices as stable as possible. Um, so they were tightening, uh, and it had nothing to do with price stability. Uh, and uh, I would submit that this time around, the Fed's not looking at commodity prices. It's not looking at inventories and how they're translating into discounts. They're looking at lagging indicators, employment and inflation, the, the headline numbers. And we'll go into that in a minute. Um, the other thing that was going on back then, and this was in 1930, was Smoot-Hawley uh, tariffs, broad-based tariffs, 20,000 uh, goods, uh, and the tariffs were in the 50% range. Well, we don't have quite that, but could this CHIPS Act, CHIPS are in everything, and I realize, realize it's just the higher end of, of the CHIPS stack, uh, but could this CHIP Act be a, a real impediment to growth? Uh, could it be the equivalent of smooth holly? We don't think so, um, but uh, one never knows. You know, history, history will, be, uh, will tell us. Um, anyway, from September of 29 to uh, July of 32, the stock market dropped 89%. Now, I mentioned with the, uh, the uh, earlier uh, part, uh, the early 20s, it went down 46% before we entered the Roaring Twenties. Um, this time it went down 80, 89%. If you compare that to the tech and telecom bust from March of 2002, uh, November of 2002, we were down 78. Um, if you look at innovation strategies like ours, like others, Many of them are down 75% plus. Um, and even the tried and true stocks, Meta, for example, is down 76% from its peak. Netflix, down 76 from its peak. Um, Bitcoin is down 74% from its peak. Now, again, what's the difference between the first two, Meta and Netflix and, and Bitcoin? 
the first two are very mature. They're not, uh, they're not the new innovators anymore. In fact, they're being disrupted. Uh, whereas Bitcoin is the disruptor. And I would submit those running real innovation strategies um, are, are more in this early stage group. And if you look at the history of Bitcoin, uh, and, and you look at uh, 2017, for example, in the context of what happened afterwards, um, you know, it looks, it looks like a blip. And we think that will continue to be the case as Bitcoin continues to gain traction and as innovation strategies continue to gain traction. You know, I was uh, asked this week in an interview um, whether, you know, how I, f how, how I could possibly feel uh, with this kind of uh, down round. And of course, it never feels good. But because of our research and because of our five-year investment time horizon, what is happening here is the rubber band is stretching. Uh, because if anything, the turmoil that we're in right now, economically and otherwise, is, uh, is going to hasten the adoption of these new technologies. Now, it is true that some stocks in the innovation space are going to be, have, have some cyclical dynamics attached to them. Uh, any, any company involved uh, or associated with marketing and advertising or so forth is going to be singed uh, in, this, in this environment. Um, Roku's been very uh, vocal about it, but if you... If you look at uh, Roku's uh, uh, statistics, um, the scattered advertising market, which is the primary as advertising market it's focused on, was down 38%. Uh, and uh, Roku's revenues were up 12%. Their platform revenues, so advertising, were up 15%. And one of the reasons is because they're becoming less reliant on sc the scatter market, which is the short-term advertising market that you can pull uh, uh, if a company is worried about uh, uh, saving their quarter or something. Uh, and Roku is now being dealt into the upfront market. It is becoming um, an important way to reach consumers and consumer products companies know that. So now it's getting some of the more stable upfront market. Uh, and, and we think that will continue to be the case. Um, now, on to economics. Again, I mentioned that the Fed is focused on lagging indicators, employment and inflation. So let's deal with those directly. Today was a Employment Friday, and we, know, we knew that the number was going to be positive. It was more positive. Non-farm payroll was more positive than expected. Initial unemployment claims had been pointing in that direction as well. So uh, non-farm payroll employment was up 261,000, uh, better than the ex expectation of 190-ish uh, thousand. Average hourly earnings were up 0.4 percent, a little, a little stronger than the 0.3 percent. Now, of course, the Fed uh, is railing against this. Uh, the Fed, the Fed wants the unemployment rate. It seems to be at four and a half percent. Well, we started, uh, we started to move up in terms of the unemployment rate. Uh, we went from 3.5 to 3.7, uh, partly because the participation rate um, uh, dropped a bit. So the Fed uh, is uh, getting its wish, I suppose. But you know what's interesting about this hypothesis? It's, it's a Phillips curve, um, not hypothesis. I, I think it's been disproven. Phillips curve says, well, if you want to get inflation down, then you have to get activity down. The history of the 80s and 90s and even into the 2000s, if you look at it, is when real growth was strong, inflation was low. Why? Because of productivity. And uh, I think that will continue to be the case. Um, nonetheless, that's what the Fed thinks. And so uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, we're probably going to see unemployment uh, rising. Um, and we're already getting some indicators. So here's the other side that the Fed isn't talking about that much. First, the Challenger job survey, it's a layoff survey, um, and it is showing uh, a 48% increase in broad-based layoffs, meaning um, layoffs that companies are announcing that cut across divisions and involve quite a number of people. 
Um, and we also uh, saw that in the purchasing managers index, again, leading indicator, that uh, employment in that index went negative uh, in this last month, October. Uh, then uh, very importantly, in the, in the em employment report itself uh, is buried a number called household employment. I don't know why they don't feature it more, the Fed in particular, because it's much broader based than a non-farm payroll survey, survey. And it includes many more small and medium-sized businesses. Um, it also includes people who are working two jobs or three jobs, and they'll just say that they're working. Um, and it also includes uh, what the, what's called the birth and death rate of small businesses. Um, and so uh, that indicator, household employment, dropped 328,000. And if you look at it since March, it's been fluctuating, but since March, it's gone nowhere. Um, now, that's not the picture that non-farm payroll is painting here. Um, but I trust this employment indicator much more than non-farm payroll because it's better at turning points uh, in the market. So think about that. Uh, for more than half of a year, this measure of employment has gone nowhere. What we think has happened in terms of non-farm payroll, which um, is much more big company oriented, is that a lot of companies had so much trouble uh, finding employees over the last two years that they, they're reluctant to let them go um, because economic indicators are suggesting they should let them go. And uh, if companies become mismanaged enough, then we probably will have more Twitter-like um, examples where a new and visionary leader goes in and cleans house. And uh, today, I guess, Twitter announced 50% of its workforce will be laid off. Uh, so uh, I do think there, that many companies are going to have to take strong action here because of what the Fed is doing and uh, because fiscal restraint, as measured by uh, federal outlays, uh, is, is so significant right now. The other lagging indicator the Fed is really focused on is inflation. Now, inflation, the, the downstream, closer to the consumer, is sticky, and it tends to be sticky at turning points. So we have the PPI still at 8.5% on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, the CPI 8.2%, uh, the personal consumption deflator 6.2%. Um, but I'd like to share with you what's in the pipeline here um, in other metrics. Dear me, I have to find it because, uh, yes, here we go. All right, so listen to this. Um, now I'm going to start, I'm going to start with um, the highest price declines from uh, their peak peaks. And, and these are as of October 31st um, when we did this report. So the Baltic Dry Freight Index, which, which really gives us a good sense of the rates, the shipping rates paid, um, they have dropped uh, 74%. They peaked uh, more than a year ago uh, in uh, October of 21, and they're down 74%. Lumber, May of 21 it peaked, it's down 73%. Iron ore, June of 21, it peaked down 52%. DRAM prices, July of 21, down 51%. Silver, uh, August of 2020, down 34%. Copper, uh, March of this year, down 32%. Oil, March of this year, down 30%. Gold, uh, August of 2020, down 21%, and corn at April of 22 this year, down 15%. Now, gold, um, interestingly, uh, peaked more than two years ago and has broken down. It stayed in a 1700 to nearly 2100 range for two years, and it's broken down. Uh, gold is a great leading indicator uh, of inflation, and uh, and it was on an upward trajectory 
which has now completely turned around. Now, a lot of these indicators are down on a year-over-year -year basis as well. Uh, Baltic freight down 58%, lumber down 22%, um, DRAM down 36%, copper down 23%, silver 20%, um, uh, gold even down 8%. Uh, you've still got oil up 4% and corn up 22%, but you can see the pipeline is full of deflation. And as we know, with the inventories, and we look at them month to month, they're still increasing. Um, again, those ships are coming. I think last quarter or last month, I described Nike's uh, inventory on ships on their way over to the United States, up 85% year over year. Um, and their North American inventory is up 68% as of the uh, end of the August quarter. Importantly, uh, the saving rate has come down to 3.1%, which is kind of shocking. Before COVID, it was at 8%. It went up to 34%, I believe, at the peak um, as the stimulus payments were working their way through. Now it's down to 3.1%, 3.1%. And if you look at what the consumer is doing, consumers taking on more debt now. Uh, and so that what that is telling us Contrary to those who think everyone has a nice little uh, cash buffer because of all the stimulus, we don't agree with that at all. A lot of people getting those stimulus payments were hand to mouth. You know, as soon as they got it, they spent it either to pay down debt or to buy food or energy. Now they're taking on debt probably to pay for food and energy. That's not good. And consumer sentiment, again, near record lows where they were, uh, where the where the University of Michigan sentiment was uh, in the early 80s. Another very provocative number recently has been home prices. If you look at the S&P CoreLogic uh, price index, it fell month to month 1.3% in September. Uh, it peaked on a month to month basis, meaning sequentially at 2.5% earlier this year. That is a massive reversal and the fastest reversal uh, that I have seen on record. Even in 08, 09, the, the reversal kind of started in 06, 05, 06 or, or, or something. Uh, so housing prices are now starting to come down and we haven't seen a price decline that extreme, the 1.3, since the 08, 09 period uh, when we were regularly at 2% declines per month. Now that, that the consumer will really feel as well, because again, the nest egg home equity um, is starting to come down. Okay, so now let's flip to the market. Um, year to date, the only thing that's worked is energy up 65%. Uh, ironically, uh, there are two reasons. Uh, ESG capital spending shut down by a lot of companies in favor of dividends and share repurchases. Um, I, think, uh, I think that's going to change dramatically uh, with uh, the midterm elections. I think the spigots are going to be open and that production is going to boom to new highs here in the United States. Uh, and then the other two uh, top performers, utilities and staples, both down 7 to 8 percent. And then on the negative side, we have year to date comm services. Of course, the uh, meta uh, was, was the poster child this year, down 44 percent. Consumer discretionary down 35, tech down 32. In the bond market, um, we're, we're getting some indicators. We now have the yield curve down more than 50 basis points. And here's another case in point where I think people are saying, oh, but the base was so low, you know, going up from 0.25% to 4% in the Fed funds rate. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Uh, the, you know, economics, in economics, activity is determined at the margin. You take a, a price up uh, that dramatically, uh, or a cost up that dramatically, 16-fold, um, there are going to be serious ramifications. And, and we, think, uh, we think they're upon us. And, you know, advertising is the first the first category uh, that businesses cut, and it's being demolished. Uh, so the markets are speaking quite loudly here. That 53 basis points on a 4% interest rates is a lot different from 50 basis points 
uh, on 15 percent, which is what we saw in the early 80s, which is the last time we saw an inverted yield curve um, this, this inverted. Uh, I think what's throwing people are spreads. Um, so spreads, the, the difference between high yield, high yield uh, bond uh, yields and the treasury yields, uh, they're up, they're moving up, but they're not skyrocketing. Um, and I think a big part of that is energy, energy bonds, and energy is a big user of debt uh, because prices are still pretty elevated and these companies are making uh, tons of money um, that, uh, that their spreads are very narrow and they're holding the broad-based aggregates down. Um, so we think if you look beyond... Uh, uh, or if you look at spreads beyond energy, you'll see some pretty significant gapping out. And that's a sign that there's some duress, duress out there. Another indicator is uh, credit default swaps. And I've been watching these, uh, especially as they relate to money center banks. Uh, we know when it comes uh, abroad to the banks, uh, Credit Suisse, for example, blowing out to all time highs. Uh, but Europe's in um, Europe. Europe has very significant problems that we may not. Um, the credit default swaps of our banks. So I keep track of Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, uh, J.P. Morgan, and others. Uh, they've been gapping out. What's going on there? Uh, and I think what might be going on is uncertainty or concern about swaps, a little bit like what uh, the, uh, the LDI problem uh, that the uh, UK was forced to address. So uh, very interested in that. Uh, I always ask our analysts to listen for questions about spreads on earnings calls, um, and they're not getting a lot of questions. Uh, uh, so maybe we'll have to make some of our own phone calls there, even though we don't own any of these banks. Um, and. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say about markets is, and many people don't have this perspective, but we remember 08, 09 because people were losing their homes and, uh, you know, it was tragic. Um, but if you looked at stocks and bonds in, in the 08, 09 period, um, uh, what we saw was in terms of wealth destruction using both stocks and bonds, 21%. So, f I mean, I'm sorry, seven and a half percent, seven and a half percent back then because bonds held up. This time around, bonds have not held up. We've had the worst bond markets since I've mentioned this before. You have to go back into the 1700s to see year to date performance worse than this. Um, and and what we are what we're experiencing, if you com combine equities and bonds, is a 21 percent uh, uh, decline in wealth, real wealth destruction. Uh, and if you look at some of the surveys, University of Michigan's survey, and you separate high income earners from low income earners, high income earners uh, sentiment is lower than the low income earners, even though the food and energy price hits have been much more severe um, when it comes to the low income. Other markets, commodity prices I just gave you, you know, is there any place to hide? Uh, I mentioned swaps uh, being uh, something we have in mind here. Um, they may have worked very well for Blackstone's uh, REIT product, but uh, when I see uh, swaps being used so significantly, I just want to learn more, shall I say. Now, the interesting thing about this environment is if you look at crypto. Uh, so Bitcoin has been incredibly stable. Uh, since it's June lows. In fact, the volatility, 30-day volatility of Bitcoin has dropped below the 30-day volatility of uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ. And you'll see that in our Bitcoin Monthly. We're publishing it this evening. Uh, and there are some very provocative charts in there uh, that are suggesting we're in a bottoming period for, uh, for Bitcoin. Now, we do have to be careful We've seen a nice base develop here. And uh, as many of you might remember from our Tesla um, uh, call in the day, uh, I said, you know, the base, whenever you have a very long base, and in the case of Tesla, it was, it was five years. Uh, but uh, whenever you have a very long base, 
um, something big is going to happen because that's the bull and the bears dueling each other. Uh, in the case of Tesla, our bet was we'd have a big upside uh, breakout, and we did. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, we would uh, expect the same. The base is not nearly uh, as long. And a lot of the, the on-chain analytics are um, supporting that point of view. Um, we're also going to be talking more about this in our market update next Tuesday. And in the next few weeks, you'll see uh, three research papers, um, one on AI accelerators, uh, one on uh, the Bitcoin energy e uh, slash utility ecosystem, pretty provocative, and one on uh, how important, maybe the most important innovation in history will be autonomous mobility. Uh, so look for those uh, papers from Frank Downing, uh, Yassine Almandra, and, uh, and, and Sam Chorus, and Tasha Kini. Um, and uh, so with that, uh, I'll leave you with uh, this idea that, once again, that Bitcoin is an example of a very early stage um, innovation that we think has miles to go. And so this down round is, uh, is in the early stages of early, early stage growth. The volatility is normal. Uh, but then again, when you look back historically, that volatility, which feels so awful at the time, uh, turns into, looks like a blip if you look backwards. And we think that's a case with truly disruptive uh, innovation around which we have revolved our strategies. Uh, as opposed to the fangs, which are being disrupted. That's a completely different story, completely different. Now, we may share some of the cyclical fallout from advertising. Um, uh, but that's it. And I think we're going to separate the wheat from the chaff here in terms of truly disruptive innovation uh, versus those being disrupted. Uh, so stay tuned and um, we will look forward to uh, sharing our insights with you over the next month. And I will be back next month. So thanks again.